Donald Trump disinvites Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors from visiting the White House? The backlash to Donald Trump's comment about NFL players kneeling is swift and deep. Carmelo Anthony has moved on. Is it time for Major League Baseball to put up the net? Is Porzingis up to task? And who and what are off topic this week? All that and more on What's the 401 Sports, coming right up. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us here at What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, it's good to see you. I hope you had a great week. Definitely. Well, let's get started. Donald Trump inserted himself into the discussion on NFL players protesting police brutality and other social injustices against minorities. Trump stated at a campaign rally in Alabama that NFL owners should fire any player who knelt during the national anthem and that fans should walk out and protest when, quote, Somebody disrespects our flags. Trump's comments ignited a firestorm. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell had his clap back when he said, and I quote, divisive comments like these demonstrate an unfortunate lack of respect for the NFL, our great game, and all of our players, end quote. Damora Smith, who is the executive director of the NFL Players Association, also tweeted, we will never back down. We no longer can afford to stick to sports. A good number of NFL players took exception to Trump's assertion that they they should not exercise their rights to free speech, their rights to protest, and also being called, quote-unquote, sons of bitches. Some notable NBA players and celebrities are standing in unison with the NFL players. Now, Mike, when Colin Kaepernick began his protest, it gathered some steam amongst sports aficionados and some journalists, but Trump's recent tweets about the subsequent protest really put the discussion to an elevated level. Mike, I ask you, what do you think about Roger Goodell's response to Trump? Well, for one, Roger Goodell has had so much controversy in his time as the commissioner throughout his his tenure in the NFL. He's had moderate at best support for this for these guys, these players that have gone out and demonstrated their protesting of the national anthem up until now. And now what he did here, this response to what Trump said with this statement when he did he gave in Alabama, I thought was very supportive of the league for these players to go out and do what they wanted to do. I thought afterwards that Goodell showed the amount of he he, he reiterated the amount of pride that a lot of these players felt throughout the league. Uh, going forward, there's a lot of criticism that we could give to Roger Goodell, the way that he's handled the Colin Kaepernick situation, no question about that. But it's almost as if from both sides, whether it's the progressive progressive people or whether it's the people that have been very critical of these protesters, Roger Goodell is going to face a mass amount of criticism as he goes forward. This is going to be the most important thing that he handles during his tenure as the commissioner. No question about it. A lot of the stuff that's gone on over the course of the last several days, the backlash from a lot of white people that feel just this outrage over these players that have gone out and gone out of their way to protest, this is something that Goodell is going to have to face. From my standpoint, to answer the question is how Goodell went, at, with, went forward with his response. I thought that this was something that, yes, he only gave really a three-sentence response to what Trump said. But for the most part, I think that this gave a lot of these players and the owners a go-ahead to go ahead and do what they needed to do on Sunday. And, of course, now the backlash has followed. And the last thing I'll say is there's been no shortage of criticism from for Goodell from people like Sean Hannity, Gian, uh, Gian Pirro, the former uh, attorney general in New York, not former attorney general, the former um, attorney general for Westchester County. So they have been all over him. This is going to be a tricky time to see how he goes forward with this, Keisha. Yeah, you know, I think ra- patriotism is becoming the new racism, but I, you know, I won't go too much off of a tangent on that. I'll just stick to Ro- uh, Roger Goodell's response and, in essence, the league's response to Trump's comments. I couldn't help but notice the hypocrisy the hypocrisy of the NFL in that Roger Goodell really is clapped back at Donald Trump for Donald Trump saying, if you protest, you should be fired. Well, we just saw that happen. We saw Colin Kaepernick protest, and he still doesn't have a job. And Roger Goodell never really has, at least to this point, hasn't taken any initiative to find out why Colin Kaepernick hasn't even gotten a tryout for any of these teams. Whether you think that he is an elite player, a good player, or even mediocre, he's still 
better than some of the starting quarterbacks that have taken the field so far in the season. And he's definitely better than some of the backup quarterbacks. And there was never any investigation, any leaning on any of the owners to really understand if there's some sort of collusion or some kind of unfair practice at at work. And then after Trump's comments, the following games, we saw a lot of teams either go into the locker room, stay in the locker room during the anthem as a unit. There were owners locking hands with their teams on the sideline. Jerry Jones took a knee, a knee with his team before the anthem. But th- these, these are the same owners that did not give somebody like Colin Kaepernick a chance to try out. These are some of the same owners who voted for Trump. These are some of the same owners who donated money to his campaign when Donald Trump was spitting the same rhetoric then as a candidate for the presidency, as he is now. So all of a sudden now you want to show some unity. But what it really says to me is that these owners are are taking a stance against somebody who's trying to impose on their domain where they have the say so. So I... You call me cynical, but that's what I saw. And I think the test, the true test is what is what happens now. Now that the owners have sh- given this signs of unity and Roger Goodell has given this clap back, what are they going to do now? What what how are they going to really promote the interests of their employees who are predominantly African-American? How are they the they as the league, the owners really going to. Um, tackle some of the issues that affect their their employees. Well, the Donald Trump saga continues, Keisha. Of course, uh, he rescinded his invitation to the Golden State Warriors. You know, Steph Curry was the one who was hesitant, and ultimately he decided that he did not want to go to the White House. And then Donald Trump was Trump's response, going to the White House is considered a great honor for a championship team. Stephen Curry is hesitating, therefore invitation is withdrawn, Trump tweeted. And North Carolina's men's basketball team will not be visiting the White House either. Now, Charles Barkley thinks teams skipping the White House visit are setting a dangerous precedent, Keisha. What do you make of this? <laughs> I think it's a joke. How do you uninvite somebody who already said they weren't coming to your White House? Steph Curry was very clear that he really did not have any intentions of going to the White House with number 45 sitting at the big desk. So you cannot invite somebody who wasn't going to come. As for Charles Barkley, I don't think that I don't think this is a dangerous precedent because one, attendance at the White House is not mandatory. Two, players have skipped the White House visit over the course of the, of the course of time, it's you know it's for whatever reason. And three, you know, Park, Barkley is coming from the stance that the Warriors are missing an opportunity to grab Donald Trump's ear and really voice concerns and talk about some issues that are pertinent to them. But my thing is, when did Donald Trump ever give the impression that he's interested in really working and addressing these issues? He met with Steve Harvey, who is African-American, he's a celebrity, and yet lauded publicly white supremacists, saying that they were fine people. He met, he appointed an African-American on his staff, and then didn't he bring one out in, in one of his rallies and say, oh, that's my friend? But yet, um, <laughs> he called law-abiding citizens, black men, sons of bitches. So to me, Donald Trump hasn't given any indication that having his ear is going to be of any betterment to Steph Curry, other minorities. And then, Mike, sometimes you just got to leave crazy alone. Just let him be. He's irrational and just pray that he does not, you know, get us into a third world war or with nukes and God knows what else with his tweets and reckless mouths. <laughs> you know, I thought that this was somewhat careless by Charles Barkley to go ahead and make a comment like this because, look, we're trying to... Athletes, specifically black athletes throughout this country right now, and we can limit it right now to the NFL and the NBA because these are the two popular sports where this has really emerged over the course of the last week. And they're trying to make progress. They're trying to do something to make things stand out, to make a statement. And here Charles Barkley is saying something like this. And Keisha, as you pointed out, what are you going to get out of meeting with Donald Trump? It's a, it's a conversation that's going to lead to absolutely nowhere. This is a guy that led his political campaign for presidency built on 
uh, just this whole process of hate and, 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 and anti-black, anti-gay, anti-women, all these things. And you're going to go ahead and sit down with this guy? I respect LeBron James, who actually came out and he supported Steph Curry, calling Donald Trump a bum. I know a lot of people were offended by that, not me. I think sometimes you just got to put people in their place, whether it's through Twitter or whether it's through whatever way that you can go ahead and, and, and speak up. You know, Donald Trump, this has gotten to the point now where, and I've read doing the research for, for these, two, just these two topics that we've been talking about, it's almost sickening when you hear the backlash from a lot of these commenters about what people have to say about this guy and the way that they've supported him it's it's insane mm, yes so the white house is going to be empty but i think one of the hockey teams is going to visit the white house soon i think but it won't be steph curry definitely not lebron james or anybody with any sense <laughs> Well, Keisha, some big news here in the Big Apple because Carmelo Anthony has left the building. It took a minute, but a deal finally was worked out for all the parties involved, and it was finally done. So Carmelo is now signed with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Anthony joins Russell Westbrook, Paul George, and company. Keisha, I ask you, will the addition of Paul George and Carmelo Anthony give OKC the ammunition that it needs to the throne the Golden State Warriors out in the West? Well, I'll just start off by saying I'm sad to see Melo go, but I am happy for him. He really needed to get out of this toxic environment, and he is going to OKC where they have welcomed him with open arms. There was quite a showing at the airport when he landed in OKC, and people were cheering and yelling. I wonder if it brought a tear to his eye. You know, if I wonder if he thought, they like me. They really like me. And, and that's it's great. I think that's, you know, especially we talked uh, in previous shows about some of the things going on in his personal life. I think this is something that's going to be good for him to, to put himself to be in a position where he's wanted and actually contending. So to, to go to your question, I think that the addition of Carmelo has shorten the gap. I don't think it's enough to overtake the Warriors, but I I like the chances of a nice competitive series should it come down to the Warriors and the OKC Thunder. Carmelo Anthony is a scoring machine. He's an offensive juggernaut, and I think Russell Westbrook has got to be breathing a sigh of relief because he brought the Thunder to the playoffs practically on his shoulders. Now, I think with OKC, as with any team that has three big superstars, that it the it, it's a matter of how they can work together because they're they have all been alpha males on their on their previous teams. Russell, he's been in OKC, uh, he was the alpha male. Carmelo, alpha male. Paul George, alpha male. All ball handlers, all scorers. So it's a matter of being able to do to sacrifice. And also Russell, mental, Russell switching his mentality to knowing and believing that he doesn't have to do it on his own. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of Nick fans have this idea that the whole Carmelo Anthony regime while he was over here was dismal and black and, and, and dark. No, it wasn't. They had some good times when he came here in 2011. You know, there were, these were some playoff teams that they were able to put together. Yes, the last several years have been very tough. They've been very dismal. They've been very gloomy. But at this point, I'm happy for Carmelo Anthony to get an opportunity to go ahead and compete. It's tough to go out there in the West. It's a lot more competitive than it is here in the Eastern Conference. But as you pointed out, Keisha, this is going to take a huge load off of the MVP from last season, Russell Westbrook. And these are games that you're going to want to, we're all going to want to tune in to see how these guys all gel together. Paul George, Melo, and of course, Russell Westbrook, I think he should be excited for this move. And I think that this is, as we said, this is a, done for all parties involved. I think everyone now can breathe a sigh, sigh of relief as we go into training camp that this whole saga is over with. Yeah, I'm just sad for myself because all these games are on the West Coast time. And, you know, I'm getting older now and I have to go to work in the morning. It's hard for me to stay up and watch these entire games. And then I try to DVR them. By the time I sit down to DVR, it's time for the next game. And my DVR piles up with all these games. Great West Coast games, but I'm sad for myself. But I'm going to probably maybe stay up maybe till 12, maybe 12.30 if I'm feeling super ambitious. But I'm excited for the Wild Wild West. But don't go away because when we come back, we have more of what's popping. 
Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. A 105 mile per hour foul ball from Todd Frazier hit a two year old girl in the stands in a game between the New York Yankees and the Minnesota Twins at Yankee Stadium. The two year old is doing okay, but Mike, I ask you, is it time for Major League Baseball to have safety nets at all of its stadiums? I think so, definitely. I mean, this is something that you don't want to get another incident like this, and this was something that was very scary. Fortunately, you know, as you pointed out, it seems like the little girl is doing fine. Todd Frazier, of course, has actually been in contact with the family. He was really worked up about it, and a lot of the players were as well. I think one of the reasons why the MLB is going to push forward with this is you know, they have the support of their players. I've seen a lot of the comments from some Major League Baseball players saying, hey, when I have my families and I bring them to the game for batting practice or whatever, I make sure they're no way near, nowhere near the field where they're going to take a chance where they could wind up getting hit. Look here at New York, you know, in City Field, they've really been sort of on the ball with this. They've put a little bit more netting as opposed to some of these other stadiums. Will there be some opposition to this from some of the old school fans that want to really have a good feel for the game? Possibly, but you know what? Maybe they're just going to have to move back because from my standpoint, you don't want to take another risk where you're going to get something like this. And Keisha, absolutely, the answer to the question for me is yes. You want these fans who are going to these games to be as safe as possible. Yes, this is a simple, cost-effective way to ensure the safety of your patrons. And I, wouldn't you rather, if you're Major League Baseball, have a safety net that maybe obstructs a view? But I think there might be some that are thin enough where the obstruction is very minimal. And, you know, spend a little bit of money instead of, you know, a lawsuit. Because, God forbid, something happened to this girl that or a death and somebody chooses to sue Major League Baseball when it could have been prevented. And, you know, I think it's a lot of baseball to ask its fans to really have their heads on swivels and pay attention for the length of a baseball game. It's very long, and obviously you can't expect a toddler or an infant to be looking around. But then even for an adult, we are definitely in a time where we are easily distracted. There's cell phones, and on the cell phones you're checking – There's fantasy baseball, you're checking scores, you're on the Snapchat, you're on Instagram, you're on Facebook, saying that you're at the game. And, you know, then boom. You yell ball. at the hot dog yeah, guy. Yeah, you yell at the hot dog guy. Then, of course, at any stadium, there's beer, there's alcohol. And you know what happens when you to your motor skills after you start consuming a decent amount of alcohol, they slow down and you're not going to be in, able to really pay attention and get your hands up or you know in, in enough time so major league baseball just shell out a little bit of money and save yourself some heartache and now here are some quick bites aaron hernandez's lawyer said that the late football player had a severe case of cte and he is planning to file suit against the nfl and the new england patriots on behalf of hernandez's daughter Floyd Mayweather told TMZ Sports that he has yet to cash his check from the Pacquiao and McGregor fights. Carmelo Anthony has set up a relief fund for Puerto Rico. The New York Yankees clinched a wild card playoff spot, go Yanks. And in Yankees news, Aaron Judge set the rookie home run record by cracking his number 50 against the Kansas City Royals. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. All right, Keisha, well, I've got one for you. Kevin Durant tried to be incognito on Twitter, but people soon figured it out that it was Durant criticizing the OKC Thunder and coach Billy Donovan. Criticism of Durant soon followed, and some of it was just brutal. Do you think this incident will follow Kevin Durant for the rest of his NBA career, or will people eventually just get over it? I think people will. Uh, get over it. We are in this kind of society where we can be easily distracted. But the question is, will Kevin Durant get over this? I feel as though he continuously lives in the past. He reminds me of the boyfriend that dumps the girl, gets a new girl, and seems to be happy with the new girl, but just cannot resist talking about the ex-flame in derogatory fashion when the ex-flame didn't do anything. The ex-flame has wished them well, has gone on about her life, and, you know, doesn't want to deal with this. So, you know, Kevin Durant, I just wish, really wish that he was... Uh, comfortable in his decision because he didn't do anything wrong. It wasn't a popular decision for some people when he decided to leave OKC and go to the Golden State Warriors, but it was a decision that he made, he had the right to make, and he should feel confident in it. And there's no need to talk about 
you know, how bad things were in OKC, especially now. If, if you wanted to talk about how bad things were, the time was last year. Because, you know, we, 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 the whole season has passed already. You've won a championship. Kevin Durant, just be, be, just be okay with your decision and just let OKC live their lives and you live your life as a Golden State Warrior. But there is a theory that, oh, that Kevin Durant may want to come back to OKC. Well, that'd be interesting. <laughs> Uh, you know, Keisha, I agree with you. I mean, I think, yes, from this standpoint, you know, it, this is up to Kevin Durant to just move forward and stop bringing up the past. At the same time, it's hard when you have all these people on Twitter and social media, Facebook, uh, I almost said um, uh, Instagrams for the pictures. It shows you how much I know. But all these people going out and you're calling your name, saying this, saying that, and it's hard to really kind of give a response sometimes. You know, for Kevin Durant, what I think he needs to do is just forget it. Just take the take the noise and just ignore it, you know, or stand up to it. If you want to want to say something to somebody, you don't have to create some fictitious name and go on these yeah. on these sites. But Put for your the name mo- on it. Right. And <laughs> you know, we can people wanna judge Kevin Durant for the decis- the decision that he has made to leave OKC and go to Golden State. I know I have. But, you know, we don't know what it was like for with him playing with Russell Westbrook for all those years. So I think this is something that people will forget sooner than later. I don't think that this is something that's going to really plague him for the rest of his career. Our photo of the week is a picture of Carmelo Anthony and Russell Westbrook posted by Paul George on his Instagram account, and everyone is happy. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy-saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. It's now time for our New York Sports Report. Well, Mike, we recently had Media Day for the NBA, so that's when teams all across the NBA cities were available, the players were available to the media, and we're just going to focus close to home in Brooklyn. So Brooklyn Nets had their Media Day, and the biggest takeaways was that uh, one, there's a really great sense of camaraderie amongst the team. They're really gelling as one, and they're looking forward to building upon last season. Now, there's some new pieces to the mix, but they the, the new additions really have seemed to come into the fold very well with the Nets that had been there from prior seasons. And, you know, Two of the biggest names uh, in the offseason and carrying into this season was D'Angelo Russell and Jeremy Lin, the two point guards. And how would they coexist on the court and the, what roles would they play? And both of them have no doubt that they can play on the court together, that their styles mesh, and that they're really getting to understand one another as uh, players to know where they where their strengths and interests lie, where they like to move on the court because the idea is that they will be sharing ball handling skills, I mean, ball handling possessions. So Jeremy Lin will have the ball and then pass off to D'Angelo, and it's just um, Jeremy knowing where D'Angelo would like to um, move and catch the ball. And so I think, you know, there's just a really nice feeling amongst the team that they are going to go out as one. You know, they don't know in terms of wins and losses what the record's going to be. They're not predicting playoffs, but definitely that's something I'm sure that would be really great for them to achieve. But it's just about going out, really being competitive, and just really, you know, being a united front. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm hoping the best for Jeremy Lin. I think that there's not to put too much pressure on him. I know that the Nets gave him this contract and everything, but I really like to see him go out and, and, and stay healthy this season and have a good year. I think one of the big goals for the Nets franchise is to get people to want to go not to see, to Barclays Center, not to see the opponent, but to actually see the Brooklyn Nets. And you know what? Um, this season there certainly is more optimism than there has been in seasons past, and there should be. And the last thing I'll say is... I. You know, the fact that they've really solidified themselves here in Brooklyn. They put their practice facility out in Sunset Park. I know they say Industry City, but it's really it's Sunset Park. And so they're really now, it's not like they're half in New Jersey, half in Brooklyn, and they're commuting back and forth. I think that will certainly help. It's tough to see your buddy, Brooke I Lopez, know. gone. <laughs> um, but this is a new beginning for them. You know, this is something that... Uh, Look, with the Knicks losing Carmelo Anthony, we know that they're going to have, we'll talk about them in a second, but they're going to have some losses piling up. Hopefully for the Nets case, that can maybe give them a little bit more wins in the win column as they get ready for this big season ahead. 
Carmelo Anthony, who has finally broken free from the Knicks and is currently with the OKC Thunder, as we mentioned earlier in the show. Now the Knicks are considered Kristaps Porzingis' team. Keisha, is Porzingis ready to be the face of the New York Knicks? Uh, well, Mike, he doesn't have a choice at this point. <laughs> he has to be ready. He is the face of the franchise. It was Carmelo, but, you know, the, the Knicks were building with the idea of making Chris Stops the face of the franchise. So now that day is here and we'll see if he can handle it. On the court, he's you know, he's definitely a skilled player. He still can improve and he's young. So he can still improve and be, you know, phenomenal on the court. But the off the court is going to be the most interesting because all with Carmelo Anthony and Phil Jackson gone, who absorbed a lot of the media attention at criticism and uh, applause alike. Now it's Chris Stapps, and it's going to be interesting to see how he can handle the, the bright lights of the media, especially in the New York City market. It's one of the largest markets in the country, and it can be ruthless. If you mess up, you will be splattered on all of the pages with the funny headlines that I like to look at in the morning while I'm making my coffee and heating up my breakfast. So, um, Ask Matt Harvey because he's he has been the subject of some really brutal headlines. So Mike, time will tell. Yeah, you know, to go back to Brooke Lopez, I think who's now in Los Angeles Lakers with the Los Angeles Lakers. One of the things with Brooke Lopez that he was able to do is while he was here with the Nets over the last several seasons, all that losing night in, night out, it gets to you, and you got to go in and give the post game interview and all that. And this is going to be a tough season for the Knicks have ahead of themselves. There's no question about that. My question is with Przingis, how is he going to handle that? Because here you have a player who's very young, trying to grow on a very young team at the same time. When those losses pile up, when you've lost seven out of ten games, how is that enthusiasm going to carry? over to make your teammates better, make yourself better, make the team better overall as you face what could be possibly a, 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 you know, I hate to say it, but 45, maybe even a 50 loss season as the Knicks get ready to face what's really now a more competitive Eastern Conference than it's been in the past. But I hope nothing but for the best for this kid. I think he averaged 14 points his rookie year. It was 18 last season. So his numbers have steadily grown over the course of the couple seasons. Defensively, he's got it. I mean, he can play pretty good defense and he's shown some toughness so, like you said, Kisa, I'll, I'll finish what you, with what you said. He better be ready because he doesn't have a choice. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Now we're going to go a little bit off topic and talk about Damon Dash, who I personally call Dame Dash. Dame Dash is the co-founder of Rockefeller Records and Jay-Z biz Jay-Z's business partner. And Dame Dash is selling his coveted sneaker collection on eBay. Hosted by Shoezium's eBay shop, the collection is packed with some of the most coveted sneakers during what was thought of as the golden era of sneaker culture. So if you are a size 9.5 or 10.5, rush right over to eBay and see what you can find and maybe you can cop some of those gold standard sneakers. Now, Mike, they're off to eBay we're going to say goodbye, but don't worry. You can keep up with us until we meet again next week by following us on Instagram and Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, All at 401 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson. On behalf of Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for joining us here at What's the 401 Sports, and we look forward to checking you out again. <laughs>